Yeah. I had added a first word then in the very end, which it says 
Perfect. I'm thinking you're going to be more prepared to have answer thanks. Hard work better than awful, Kayla. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to all of you here, all of you online. Uh, welcome to the All Souls Community, the All Souls Community Forum, coming to you from All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City. I'm Joe Robertson, a member of this church and a member of the forum committee supporting this forum that for nearly 80 years has been leading important and compelling conversations on issues of the day. Today, we are honored to have Jackson County Prosecutor Dean Peters Baker, who has dedicated her tenure in public office and the fearless and compassionate advocacy for victims of crime, working with police and community leaders in confronting the pernicious problem of violence. You've read about her in the news. She's never wanted to back down. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Madam Prosecutor. Welcome to the forum. Good morning. I think I walk a little bit, so I'll maybe take this off if that works. All right, everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. And uh, thanks for joining on a cold Sunday morning. My son is here from uh, taking his college break, and I think he has learned already that attending college in North Carolina makes your blood a little thinner when you come back to Missouri. It was kind of him to get out of bed and and drive me over this morning. So my name is Jean. I am your prosecutor. Um, I went to a forum recently over in Kansas where um, people I don't see on a too regular of a basis, a, a lot of lawyers in that crowd, some Kansas judges, and I tell them uh, what I think is important to tell you that um, I'm a real person. I don't just play a lawyer on TV. I actually am one in real life. I feel like um, that is often how I'm seen, and when you're seen in that way, sometimes it can it can uh, take a little toll on how people view you, um, because I may be a little different than um, I'm portrayed to be. I'd like um, to talk a little bit about public safety today, and public safety specifically as it applies to Kansas City, but I wondered if we could have a couple of agreements we're, before we get started. Um, the first thing I ask is that we, could we all agree that black people are not inherently more dangerous than any other person in the universe? Yes. We can. Now, I'm sorry that I have to ask that because not everybody agrees with that. You seem to be, um, you seem to be strongly um, supportive of that, and thank you. That means you're good readers and you're, uh, you understand history. Uh, you'll understand why I'm wearing this t-shirt today. It's my uh, truth t-shirt. It is, um, there is a, I don't know how strong the movement is, but to a movement to rename truth to, to truth, because uh, <laughs> I know it's, it kind of fits, doesn't it, right? Um, truce is that line in our city, that major dividing line, and it has been historically. It's why our city remains so divided, because in Kansas City, we did redlining, as many cities did, but we were so effective at it, we're still facing the impacts of it today. And you can literally see it on Troost. Um, you can see it in many of um, crime stats that we have. The enforcement strategies east of Truce are often quite different than the enforcement strategies west of Troost. Now, I'd also like to ask um, if we could all agree 
that um, there is no one sole person or no sole entity that's responsible for this problem that we find ourselves in regarding violence. I think we could all agree to that as well. I get pitted, it seems, a lot against my Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, and I am just a one gal. I'm scrappy, grew up on a farm, um, I'm willing to fight, but that's a big entity to fight. So I don't relish that fight. I don't like that fight. I'd much rather we find some points of agreement um, like we once did. We once did, and in some stats that I'm going to show you, you'll see um, how that kind of collaboration actually had such a great impact in Kansas City. So we're going to get to that, though. OK, so we've got some points of agreement. Let's see if we can go through and, and talk about crime. Um, a couple other things I, I would like you to take away from this, you know, right in the middle of a police chief selection process for Kansas City, that is a most important position. And no one here has any say in who it's going to be. That seems quite wrong because you all pay for that police department just like you pay for the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office. Um, me, you get to vote on me and throw me out every four years if you, if you are unhappy. But that's not true with the police department. And because we don't have state control of the department, it does create a lot of other tensions within the city. But that police chief selection process is going on now. Um, I have not heard yet um, if they're going to be community forums. I would pray that they're going to be. And I would ask you guys to go and make sure that your voice is heard um, because the, there is a lot of ways that our city gets divided, north and south, um, not just east and west. So remember that, and I think it's very important for you to go and hear, have your voices heard as well. Now, um, I think even though I'm proud of my system, I'm proud of being a Jackson County prosecutor, we'll also say that our system is pretty broken. It doesn't work so well. And we know that because we know that the vast majority of crime that happens in the city it's not even solved by the police. So it doesn't even come to my desk for y'all to grade my performance on it. It doesn't even get to me. So only, in, only about one in two homicides get to me. Only about one in two. And non-fatal shootings, only about one in five, one in six get to me. Those are bad numbers um, because those are very large numbers of people. And then there's a lot of other crime that we have to worry about as well. Um, now, as I said earlier, this, uh, this failure impacts everyone in the public safety system, but no one person is at fault for this. No one entity, um, no singular policy, but we all suffer from it. Now, I know that's kind of depressing, but I know we can do better because we have, we have. Right here in the city, we have done better. And we did it through collaboration, very, very high levels of collaboration. Um, but it must be, that must be the answer going forward, collaboration. So um, while we have this new leadership role that's coming to us, I think it's important for us to demand of whoever our next police chief is that they're a true collaborator just with the prosecutor in the courts. You would expect that. That's a low bar. But with community, with community agencies, um, because through this combat tax that you guys are so generously um, support, we fund a lot of community agencies in Kansas City that address crime, drug treatment, um, and a variety of other issues that help lift people up out of poverty. And without that, I'd hate to see where we are. Right now, we are sixth. We are the sixth most violent city in the nation. Sixth. And that's not new. All right, I talked a little bit about uh, clearance rates. And this chart is just a little bit dated. I use it because I didn't create it. You can see who did. The uh, Kansas City Star. So call them if you're mad. But this. Um, this is 2014 to 2017. And you can see for murder in 2017, um, 
our, we were at 50.7% in our solves of murder. Nationally, it's at 60%. So we fall below nationally in almost every single category and sometimes substantially below what the national clearance rate is. You know, it's important for us to look at that. It's important for us to look at that, to grade how are we doing. If we're doing this poorly, below the national average, isn't it okay to say maybe we're not great? Maybe we have room for improvement to address that problem. Now, I want to point out a little part of this chart. There's a lot of numbers on here, but there's one on here that's really important to me. Not sure there's a laser pointer on here, is there? No, that just shut us off. Okay. 2014, this was a big year for us. Um, Kansas City's solve rate for homicide was 70.9%, so almost 71%. And the national clearance rate that year for murder was 61%. What happened? What do we want to do? What did we do this year? We should do that again um, because oh, that was a big deal. Now, I want to tell you more about why that was a big deal because in 2014, we really dipped in the number of homicides that we had as well. So it's great to solve homicides and it's great to get that to the prosecutor and it's great to get justice in a court of law. That's what I do. You know, it's even better than that. They don't happen that they don't happen. And in 2014, we hit a low. Um, the numbers sort of creep around as to kind of where we ranked that year, but I think the, the number that we tend to go by is, is 76 homicides occurred that year. Um, and we're way past that number right now. Way, way past that number. So um, we're in some real historic highs for violence. So I wanna just show you a little bit. I have a crime strategies unit in the prosecuting attorney's office. Uh, Mike Manser here helps serve with me in that unit. We're a small and mighty little unit. Um, but what we did smartly, took us a while to get this smart, but we hired a data analyst. And that data analyst helped us figure out a few things about how well I'm faring, how well am I doing? And I made some um, direct pivots after what that data analyst really showed me about my own data in my own office. Now, um, it's important to look at this chart because this kind of shows you really um, the bulk of the problem. On homicides, uh, like I said, only about one in two actually end up coming to the prosecuting attorney's office. My file rate on homicide is really quite high. Um, and that's probably because I sent a prosecutor to every homicide scene that happens, no matter if it's, most of them, by the way, are at two o'clock in the morning rather than two o'clock in the afternoon. And so we have a really dedicated staff that's willing to go out and do that. Um, Non-fatal shootings, however, are a real problem. And the number is so much greater. Now, um, we'll probably have well over 600 non-fatal shootings this year. And of non-fatal shootings, these are just homicides that didn't quite happen. Probably luck. Um, if not luck, maybe it was skill. Maybe there was a good, um, able doctor in the emergency room. Maybe a great paramedic. Maybe a great police officer that got there first. Um, you know, we cannot have a whole um, policy of luck, though. We have to do better than luck. And so um, these should really, really concern you because the numbers are so high. They're so very hard to get solved, and they're so very hard to prove in a court of law. And the harm is great. The harm is really, really great. Because now, um, this is a bullet that actually struck skin. And that means someone's off work, maybe permanently. Maybe it's just temporary, but think about the impact that has on a whole family unit. One person in the family unit 
got struck by violence, and the whole family suffers for it. Evictions often follow these. Job loss, and it's a whole spiral downward. And these are not small numbers for, you know, we're not a great big city. My mom thinks we are, but we're really not a great big city. Um, so for us to have over 600 non-fatal shooting victims each year is, is a pretty big statement. It's what makes us always in the top 10 list for violence. And our sister city in St. Louis is first. So um, we want to show you a little bit about the national clearance rates. This is 2018. We um, are comfortable giving you these numbers. This shows you um, cleared versus uncleared. Uncleared is just police don't know who did it. And uh, these numbers are pretty abominable. I use this example, and I hope it doesn't offend. But if you, if you needed uh, work done on your car and you took your car to a mechanic that says, you know, I do pretty good about one in every six times I look at a car, would that be good enough for you? Would you go to the mechanic that has that kind of banner? You wouldn't. But that's how we're faring in law enforcement. So we shouldn't also pretend that we're great when we're not great. We're just not. That doesn't mean we're bad. And I'm not saying, you know, that, that um, there's just a huge problem here and, and I'm trying to expose something. I'm saying we have got to look at this collectively to figure out how we can help police do a better job solving these and then more importantly, how to prevent them from happening. So I wanted to show you this historical chart of homicides. This is going to be a little bit hard for you to read, but I can tell you that it starts uh, down here in 1968 at the bottom, and it goes all the way to 2017. Is that right, Mike? 2017. Um, bottom got cut off a little bit. But this shows you, this um, dotted line is um, where it shows you that we are almost always just over 100 or just below it just very, very much below it. So it's, uh, this is, people tell me frequently, gosh, Ms. Prosecutor wasn't violent like this when I was growing up. And I'm like, it wasn't? I think it was. I think it was. Now, again, there's a great little dip in here, and I want you to look at this year. This is 2014. And we did something pretty great that year. Um, our effectiveness fell off. Um, but it was a great year, and it's one that could be replicated. This is geography. Uh, you should see in your city sort of where harm really does occur. And um, each one of these red dots is a violent crime incident. And it just shows you um, that it's fairly well concentrated within the city. So there's Paseo, and I think the church is on here. Is that right? Did we do that? Like, no. <laughs> the church is not on here, but we can find it. Um, so, right, we should be right up in here. So it's a, this is a pretty concentrated problem. Uh, once you get north of the river, um, once you get uh, to State Line Road, or actually you don't even have to get to State Line Road, uh, you can stick to pretty close to Troost. I may imagine that. Um, then you you go pretty far south, it's not a problem, and you get into some of our suburbs, and this is not a problem. So it's a real concentrated issue, which can cause us to have some really bad things. And you got to be a you got to be a good thinker here. We all said at the beginning, um, we were not going to reach to a trope about crime. Um, but some of us do reach to tropes. And there's there's one I wanted to point out here. Um, it's why I got to keep saying this. Really disappointingly, I think I got to keep saying this. But um, someone brought me 
Ingrams. Anybody read Ingrams for Kansas City? Yeah, I used to think it was a great little magazine. Um, until I read an article um, about crime in Ingrams. And um, Jack Cashel is the author. And he says, he says the problem about crime is inner city culture. And he says a lot of other things that are pretty offensive. Um, but this is how a lot of people think. And it's really damaging and really harmful. And it keeps us locked in to this problem. We're never, we're never going to get out of this problem through the Ingram's view of the world. We're never going to get out of it that way. We'll be stuck here. But there is a way to get out of this. And so I want to talk about what some of those are. Um, this geography is hard, but we know why that geography exists. Um, we know that redlining occurred in Kansas City and that we were very effective at redlining in this city. Um, one, because you could just look right out your window here and you see this really beautiful uh, country club plaza, which was designed um, you know, by somebody that was a really great engineer, built a lot of neighborhoods in Kansas City. Um, but those covenants lasted um, embarrassingly a, um, a long, long time. And in the neighborhood that I live in, just south of the plaza, you really just don't see black families. They don't live there. So it, it, it worked, what was trying to be achieved through redlining. Okay. Um, oh, there's American Century. We put, we put American Century on. Okay. So let's, let me give you just a little bit of some um, information about who's getting shot in Kansas City. Um, so this is um, people and their age ranges around the bottom. Basically, age 16 uh, to 30 is really our big category. So those are the, those are the people that are most likely to get shot. Um, and the blue line is the non-fatals. So you see that there's far more non-fatals and the gray line is homicides. So that is how many more non-fatals we have than homicides. I'm gonna go back to this crime chart again because it's not just violent crime that's a problem. It's also property crimes. Probably everybody in this room has been a victim of a property crime. When I go to the east side, almost everybody in the room has been a victim of violence in some way. Family members been struck. Um, but here, in a room like this, we probably have had cars stolen, cars broken into, burglaries. I have. It's happened to me as well. Um, and property crimes is a big, big problem for police as well, for all of us, for our community. Such a big problem that in 2020, out of 22,831 reported property crimes, I'm going to say that number again. 22,831 reported property crimes. Only 1,539 were solved. So um, you'll hear me often, um, please pit me often against them in the whole property crimes uh, arena. Anybody had a police officer ever show up at one of your community events and say, well, that prosecutor won't file anything. She won't take them. She won't take that burglary, so we don't even bother to bring it to her. Yeah, that happens a lot. I get called in behind police officers a lot and um, have to answer to that. Um, the truth is, this is a really terrible problem because our numbers are grand. And again, we're so far below the national average on solve rates. Now the now look, the national average is pretty bad here too. For stolen auto, it's only 9%. The number, we're looking at the year 2017. Stolen autos was only 9% 9, 9 nationally for solves. But in Kansas City, it was only 2.2, 2.2%. So again, um, we ought to be able to look at crime in its actual numbers, its raw numbers, and see, now where are we failing and how can we do better? And how can we ask our police department to do better? Because it is our, our police department. 
All right, there's also um, cost of crime. And um, this number now is a little bit dated. Um, we had a professor that we work closely with, hopefully uh, to work with uh, Ken Novak again soon on car stops. But um, back in 2013, he really helped us uh, lead us to that 20 year 2014 where we had the low dip in homicides and non-fatal shootings. But he put together the cost of a single homicide, the hard cost is about $1.2, $1.3 $1 million per singular homicide. Those are just the hard cost. The tangible costs um, were much more like eight to $9 million. I'm a prosecutor, I like hard evidence. I don't like stuff too soft. So I, I take that number off because it just bothers me a little bit. Um, but I do trust Professor Novak uh, to put together a number that um, was based on fact. So there's a real cost to this. So if there's a cost, there's a cost savings as well. So if we could start doing better, um, we could actually save cost with crime reduction. So um, again, we put uh, the cost up there of not just murder, but also aggravated assaults. And that's, the, that's that bullet to skin ratio. Um, this is pretty costly and it taxes um, our police department and it taxes your prosecutors and it taxes your court system. And man, does it tax the community that lives just a few blocks that direction. So here's some good stuff that we, um, we are doing again and that we had done in the past. This is me uh, with Mayor Sly James when he was um, our mayor. And he was a really good partner uh, regarding violence. He was all part of that effort with, with me in 2014 as well. We are at the door doing something called a custom notification. And we did these back in 2013 and 14 and, and in 15. And we uh, knocked the door of people that we knew that were engaged in violence as victims or defendants, shooters, um, are or not. Um, it was important for us to knock on the door of, of people who we knew were engaged in a criminal activity because it's important that we reach them somehow before they end up in a pine box or handcuffs. So um, this is happening again. I went to the new police chief, the interim chief, and I said, hey, remember when we used to do this? Wouldn't it be great if we started that again? Now, we're doing it in, in pretty small numbers right now, but we are doing it. Um, so we are back in the ethic of doing this. Beyond this, um, I mentioned combat earlier. Combat has a referral system now. Police are now, uh, once again, sharing with us, meaning the prosecutors, so that we can share with others um, through combat, uh, our community service agencies, those individuals who are victims of crime. Um, their cases are not being solved, but instead of just leaving them hang out there on their own, we have agencies that are responding to them and trying to help them uh, through all that trauma that comes with being shot or someone being killed in your family. And what do you do next? How do you support yourself? How do you address your trauma? Um, sometimes there was a lot of trauma before that event happened. And so we get in there and try and figure out what things can we do to assist you. Maybe it's um, something simple. You need work boots. Um, maybe you need drug treatment. That's less simple, but we, we can do that in the city. Um, maybe it's um, you need educational training. So we offer a variety of services, whatever is needed. And to me, um, this is important because we just started doing this again. Um, we just, the police really shut down uh, for a period of time um, with partners like me. <laughs> um, I laugh because shutting down was a little less than, a little less accurate description for what it was. We're back, our doors are back open again. And we are sharing information with each other. Most importantly, they're sharing it with me so that I can help um, be that conduit to other agencies 
to help my victims get some service. Because if hurt people hurt people, I'm stealing this from a fellow I learned who taught me, then healed people can heal people. And even if that weren't true, what kind of community do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the Kansas City that allows people to get shot, no one brought to justice, and they just figure it out on their own? Hopefully they got a church family. Hopefully they got an auntie. But if they don't, well, good luck. Or would you rather live in a community that helps people who have been harmed in your community, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, no matter, no matter even if they've been engaged in a lifestyle that you don't approve of. A healthy community helps those in need. It doesn't leave people out. So um, these are some of the things that we're doing now. All right, I'm going to flip through because I think, um, I think I'm, I'm not following, I don't I, I missed my watch this morning, but I'm going to flip through some of this quickly. Um, okay, let's, um, I do want to talk about car stops. Thank you for putting this in, Mike Manser. We want to, I want to talk about car stops because um, it is another area that um, we need to look at. And we really need to look at it collaboratively, not just the prosecutor looks at car stops and wants to address car stops. I want to do it with police. I want to do it with police so that we can look at what are we doing and what car stops are we doing and what car stops actually hurt us versus helping us. For instance, what I mean by car stops, and I, I got to get in the ditch here a little bit on car stops. I didn't mean to do this. I'm sure Mike wanted me to just mention this and move on. But car stops, we have a great um, disparity in who's getting pulled over. You know, this room is, I think, all white. It ain't you all that's getting pulled over. The numbers reflect this. And it's just not a new problem. This is an always problem. And if you start digging into those numbers of car stops, who's getting pulled over, when and where and for what, and who's consenting to searches of their cars, and what are they finding, those are the kind of questions that we need to be asking, very granular questions so that we can find out this. Are we doing a series of car stops that is actually not keeping us safer and actually might be harming us on the backside? Think about this. Think about if your family or you as an individual, you keep getting pulled over by police. And maybe there was a reason. You didn't use your left turn signal when you should have. You didn't make a full stop at the stop sign. I slow roll. I'm going to, I do, I slow roll often. Um, but think about the impact that has later. You feel harassed by police. You don't feel like you were treated fairly. And then we need that person to tell us something that they saw, something they know, about a crime, a violent crime that happened in their community? Do you think there could be an impact on the backside of a whole collection of car stops that actually don't produce anything to keep us safer? If car stops are to help our public safety, shouldn't we think about public safety a little bit deeper, a little bit more granularly? And if we could reduce some of those car stops, well, think about Think about what could happen. We might actually reduce an officer's time doing things that kind of don't really matter that maybe on the backside might actually hurt us. And call times for service might actually decrease. So when you really do need police, and man, we do. We do need them. We need strong police. When you dial 911, you need them to come and as quickly as you can, as they can get there. So there could be a lot of benefits in this. So that's just a precursor for what might come later. We're working on this piece. Um, this is um, 
uh, also a pretty difficult chart to read, but it um, it just tells you how my office has fared during homicide. You know, in our, our my own office regarding homicides. Um, you know, there's we we often feel um, or get called to community groups like this because police. To be blunt, please just say pretty awful things <laughs> about us. And I, it's a shame because it um, I'm willing to look at my data and I'm willing to tell you where I fare well and where I don't. This is um, the year 2019 um, because then COVID came along and it kind of really knocked our numbers around. So I don't, um, I don't know how well those numbers are trusted. But in 2019, um, I had 148 homicides in Kansas City, and KCPD solved 63 by that year's end. And then in all of Eastern Jackson County, because I don't just prosecute in Kansas City, by the way, I go all the way out to near Oak, uh, outside Oak Grove. Um, 20 homicides were in Eastern Jackson County and police solved 19. Right, that is an O. I saw O in the audience. 20 homicides occurred in Eastern Jackson County in the year 2019 and police solved 19. So I'm not able to file every single one of those homicides that come to me. I will tell you, you do not, you do not want a prosecutor who is a rubber stamp. You want a prosecutor who actually engages in the analysis of the law and do I have enough because Sometimes I do play a lawyer on TV. You maybe saw I did a TV uh, series, I Do Innocence, last fall. Sometimes we get it wrong. And to undo those wrong homicides is uh, quite a battle. That was a brutal, brutal battle to, to free Kevin Strickland. And so we want to get it right. We want to get it right. That means not everybody um, gets charged that the police submit on. But I went ahead and told you about the cases that I declined. Five were declined due to self-defense. Uh, five were declined due to insufficient evidence, meaning I didn't feel like it was enough. It wasn't quite enough. Uh, two defendants that actually passed away, they died. You can't prosecute a dead person. And um, three were declined for other reasons. Um, and I think two of those that year were juveniles uh, that stayed in the juvenile system. And I think one was actually being handled by the federal government. So, um, Anyway, I'll, I'll you know go ahead and show you the the backside of this. Basically, what you what you want to know is that our average time for homicide is right here twenty three point two years. Um, because you'll hear a lot that Jackson County ooh, crimes rampant. The prosecutor she just doesn't care about crime there. She just wants more crime to happen, and um, and she doesn't you know she doesn't even try uh, to give out uh, adequate sentences. And this is the state average, I think, is we are just above the statewide average. Is that right, Mike? Do you remember that? So I think, um, I think it, the statewide average was about 22 years. And we, so that kind of shows you where we are. It's, that's pretty good. Um, now, I don't, I don't like to go around town and tout a number like that because each homicide is different. They have a different set of facts. And I'm not looking for a particular number before I even have met the set of case facts and the defendant to know what's the right answer. Um, that's also my job. My job is not to be the toughest, baddest um, person I can be. It's to be the smartest and the most calculating and the most measured, the most uh, strategic person um, because that's because I'm actually a minister of justice. That's my job. So. I think in presentations like this, it's probably best, you know, that we allow some time for questions, but I did want you to see a bit of kind of who we are, what we do, how we do it. Um, and before I kind of turn over to questions, I did want to put this out there as well. This homicide analysis was great. It, it surprised me. We did a little bit better uh, than I thought we did, given the critique I hear from my police department. Um, but one area that we did pathetically poorly was in drug prosecution. It was bad, bad. My numbers were embarrassing. 
and um, they were so racially imbalanced that we had to make a change. And so we started in the year 2020 to look at um, in real granular detail, what are we doing in certain categories of crimes? And drugs was one of those categories where we learned that about um, 81 to 84% of all the, the drug dealing cases, the distribution, delivery, or the sale of a, a controlled substance were black people. 81 to 84%. Oh man, come on. Come on. You know, because here's what we know about drugs. Everybody uses them. And it's not like the 80s and 90s even. Um, everybody uses all kinds of drugs. It's not like I'll use an old trope in independence, they only use methamphetamine. That's not true. It's not true. Um, we all use, all racial demographics use all drugs. It's just the truth of it now. Maybe that wasn't always true. Maybe you could, you could tie people to certain types of drugs once upon a time, but not anymore. So that means where do you police? Where are you trying to enforce drugs? And because I paid a lot of money for this young man to go to a great institution, in Kansas City, I pick on it. If we wanted to find a drug dealer, we could find one at about 3.15 in the afternoon in the parking lot of a great high school just across the way here, private high school. We may have to wait just a few minutes, but there'll be a drug dealer there. We could find one. We don't look there. That's not where we look. We look in the parking lots of other schools, but we don't look um, at Pembroke Hill. Now, I want to defend police on this. Police say, don't pick on us um, like we're just picking out black people um, to try and stick drug cases on. We go where violence is. And because violence is high east of truce, that's why we have been you know, working hard on drug enforcement east of Troost. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? But then you have to ask yourself, how is that working? How is it working? Is it working? Is it reducing violence? Or is, is, does it have a, does it actually have a worse impact? Because if communities don't believe that you are policing them fairly, you're not going to get fairness back. That's just the way it's going to be. And when you need them, and we will need all members of our community when violence strikes, you won't have them. And I know that. I knew that as a very young prosecutor. I've been doing this for about 25 years um, because I used to prosecute homicide cases. And I'd have to go out and beg, beg people to come to court to testify. That was even on the solved ones. So we must work toward better solutions with our community. This um, Jack Cashel, he did drop my name in his article. I guess I'll give him some credit for that. I, I made it in the Ingram's article on crime. But he says that I'm more concerned with achieving equity than reducing crime. I don't know what that means. Equity, if you're seeking equity, it should mean for everyone. I'm not seeking to harm another group of people. That's just so silly. Equity means for everyone. You know that theory that all boats rise? That's what this is. Um, I'm just trying to find fairness in my system. And when I looked at the drug cases that I had, I looked beyond race, by the way. I wanted to see, I wanted to see, I was curious, which cases, which of those drug cases, drug possessors, drug dealers, which one resulted in violence later? Which one was connected to violence? 
and shockingly, because um, I've been a prosecutor, like I said, a long time, I'd always been taught drugs will equal violence. It will happen. It's just a matter of time. Hey, that's not always true. It's sometimes true. But in my data, we went back five years. It was only true about 25% of the time. 25% of the time. That really knocked me over. I, I had a hard time believing that. And that poor young uh, analyst that we had, he had a, we sent him back probably 10 times to look at those numbers. We didn't believe him. And then the reading that I did said, well, that's probably about right. Um, but it's just not what I believed. It's not what I believed. But we got to be careful about what you believe when the data tells you something different. You got to you got to be willing to trust data. Now you you've got to refine it. It's got to be trustworthy. But then um, that's what we did, at least regarding drugs. And we created a policy in my office that said, "Hey, police, we want your drug cases." If, if you can show me that that person's a neighborhood nuisance, meaning the neighbors are very concerned about this person, they want us to take this case because they're destroying the tranquility of a block or a neighborhood, or two, that person's connected to violence. And we gave a very broad definition of violence. Um, for us, violence even included um, a kid that might be in the backseat of a car during a car stop and you had drugs. So we might call that endangering the welfare. Um, so I'm just saying um, there's, there's room for us, us folks, us bureaucrats in public service. There's room for us to learn and grow and do a better job. And if we can do that, maybe we can go back to that great year of 2014. And when we all collaborated together on an effort called Focus Deterrence in Kansas City, and actually reduce violence. The great thing was we reduced violence, solve rates went up. It was all, it was a beautiful thing. Now we fell off the next year, we ended up with um, I think about 110, maybe 109 homicides that next year. Mike, I always look at Mike because he's supposed to remember these numbers just off the top of his head. <laughs> 1968 was the number, Mike. See? <laughs> That's why I take him with me. So um, the point is, though, um, you want to we want to try and find ways to to actually eliminate homicide, sure as hell reduce homicide from occurring. And if you can do that, then you're really improving the lives of community. It's an obvious thing to say. Though it's so obvious, we have not been in the collaboration business to reduce homicides during the last several years. What a, God, that's the worst thing I can say to you today, that we have not been in the collaboration business in Kansas City to reduce homicides for several years now. But it's time to go back. And I think you guys have a real opportunity to help with that. So remember, watch for any community meeting regarding uh, your next police chief. And remember, that at least if you remember anything I said, please remember I, I begged you for a collaborator, a true collaborator, a, and somebody that actually believes that Kansas City can be better, that they believe that the police department can do better, can do better. It's not already great. We can make it even better. We can solve more crime. So um, I think that's it. Anything else? From yeah. me? Well, sure. Uh, yes, yeah, please hang on here. But now we, we've been listening to Jackson County Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker. And before we get to the question and answer uh, portion of our forum, we're going to pause here, take a moment to take up a collection to support this program. And you can also contribute online by going to allsoulskc.org. And I also want to tell you about uh, next Sunday's forum. Craig Vollen will be here to talk about climate change, industrialized food systems, and the possible role of regenerative agriculture. Okay, so we welcome now your questions. Uh, we ask you to come up here to this, where I am, this microphone here at front. And uh, and if you are, I will also try to monitor the you know the chat online. If streamers want to uh, type of questions, we'll try to get them asked. 
All right. So, and remember to uh, make uh, statements, avoid, I mean, avoid making statements and just give our county prosecutor your question. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Some time ago, um, our current mayor mm -hmm. got into a discussion relating to the total amount of money, which is uh, aimed at crime reduction as a as a as an entity. And I think that one of the suggestions that he made was that we'd like to see some money going into actual. Um, programs within neighborhoods, which would um, allow for uh, individuals and groups of individuals to do better in certain ways. And I wondered if you could comment about how you feel about um, what would be some of those ways that you would favor, and um, do you do you agree with him that 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 sort of targeting might be a good idea so that the, if the crimes don't occur in the first place, then the police don't have to respond and the prosecutor doesn't have to prosecute. Could you talk about that a little bit? I do agree with the mayor on that philosophy. And in fact, um, he and I serve on a, um, I should have mentioned this board together and the, the interim police chief as well on something called Partners for Peace. Um, what I think where we missed, it's the same kind of effort we did in 2014. We don't yet have the policing strategy that's going to go into play here um, because that really is uh, being saved for, I think, the next police chief obviously determine the direction of their department. However, in 2014, we did focus deterrence with, at that time, Chief Daryl Forte. The piece that we left out was really community. Community was not at our table in a real meaningful way. And with uh, this mayor, um, things I learned, you know, the, of, of having that great year in 2014 and then falling off, um, even, I will say, even our failure years after 2014 were so much better than what we've experienced the last three years, four years. Um, I'd like to, you know, even tout my failure years were, were better uh, than we have had now. But that Partners for Peace effort is um, a collaboration with true community partners at our table in a planning um, planning way. And they're really our greatest resource that we have. It's really not my office. You know, the greatest resource we have is those community agencies that are already funded. They do the work. And whether or not we can expand them and, and give them more resources is the question. And um, I think it's the difference, I believe, between us and St. Louis. Why is St. Louis first and we're sixth and we have the same gun laws or lack thereof? We have um, a lot of the same kinds of problems. Um, so how are, we, how are we in a better shape? And I think it's because we have funded community service agencies now in this city for over 30 years. Um, we've done drug treatment in the community. and um, and we've, we've, we've funded agencies like that so that people do have a place to go. But right now we're trying to, you know, we're trying to be sort of a, a more organized, centralized hub for each one of these victims that's struck by violence, each one of these families, there is a place for them to go and someone's helping to lift them back up. So I'm not exactly sure what the mayor meant um, through some of those comments, but I do believe going back to those those agencies and those neighborhoods that where we can show um, experience the most crime and the most harms outside of crime, the highest eviction rates, those are the places we really need to go and put our attention. Hi. Um, I was wondering what you're doing uh, to reduce help reduce uh, violence against trans people, particularly trans women and trans women of color? What a great question. What a great uh, weekend to be given that. Um, so we just on Monday, uh, two police officers, two former police officers of the KCPD pled guilty, pled guilty, pled guilty um, to harming a, a woman named Brianna Hill. Brianna Hill um, was was being arrested, though she's the one who called 911 for help, um, and um, she was very roughly treated. 
I don't know how else to say it. Um, it was a um, felony assault. It's what they pled guilty to. So that exposed a whole new layer for me of, of victims um, that I wasn't as aware of at the time until that case came through my office. And um, I have partnered with two other agencies since then so that reporting could go to these other agencies and then come to me. Um, as you'll know, of course, because KCPD were the aggressors in that case, um, it didn't. that case did not come from the KCPD. It came through a, another means to get to me. So we want those cases. And I, I mean anyone who's harming. I'm not, I'm not just saying um, that we're looking for police officers. We're not. We're looking for whoever harms people in that community. We want to know about it. We want them to feel safe to report. And so there are a couple of agencies that we're using in the hopes of getting more of those cases that way, but perhaps too, just getting the word out that we care about you, we want your case, we don't, we don't, uh, we recognize that this is a population of people that are very marginalized, uh, not just in our city, everywhere. Um, and so they need our help and support and they need the justice that can come from our criminal justice system. So I hope to see more of those cases in the hopes that there's less harm to those people. This is just a comment. My husband and I, we lived in Japan for a period of time. Oh, my husband and I, we lived in Japan for a period of time and the country of Japan, absolutely no guns, period. That's it. Well, that would be a, uh, that, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Good morning. Uh, I do attend Board of Police Commissioners meetings occasionally. I was there the day you spoke to the board and pleaded uh, to with the board and the police officers there, the leadership, to stop referring uh, non well, I'm going to characterize as nonviolent cases, so it would free. You were being uh, nonviolent flooded. drug cases there you go. that had a huge disproportionality of race um, when they were coming to right, me. Right, right. Um, and I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think you also brought up the point that uh, when there was a, a case involving, I'm going to call it police brutality, police shooting, that you were reliant on the police to forward such cases to you, that there would be cases that happened that you never, you were never referred to you for prosecution. Could you discuss with us your view, your view of uh, why police brutality happens in Kansas City. The shootings that the star describes that just sound like they're just stupid, frankly, in some cases. What's your view of um, the management of police brutality in Kansas City? Ooh, that's a, okay, is this working? No, we're out. <laughs> um, this is where you get me in trouble if I wasn't already in trouble. Um, we, this department has had serious issues. You cannot, I could not stand before any microphone and, and experience the last three years um, and say anything different. We had to fight and scrap and claw to get those cases, any charged police officer, um, I had a, I mean, I fought for them to get them. And, um, as I stand here today, um, I think four Kansas City, Missouri Police Department um, officers have been found guilty by a court um, in less than the past year, I think in, in about a year's time. So um, look, I want a department um, that wants to flush out those who do harm. I want a police department um, that is that has officers that we trust, and when we dial nine one one, we know they're going to come, and they we know they're going to treat us uh, with fairness, all of us. And um, I just hope and pray um, that we're in a we're in a moment of very big change. That that's what we get that we need a leader that can lead us through uh, that next chapter of the KCPD. Now, here's the other thing. I ain't going nowhere. 
So there's that too. I'm not going nowhere. I've already signaled I want to look at car stops. Um, I'm going to keep pushing because that's what I believe I believe my job is, is to keep pushing. But I don't push just to push. Uh, because I actually don't really like um, being in a high conflict role. <laughs> I don't like. I don't care for it to tell you the truth, because uh, you know I'm already in a court system, which is an adversarial process. So to then to also have to take on your police is, it's almost sometimes one thing too much. Um, but I will keep doing it because um, I want to defend and support my police who are doing a good job. That doing the job the way they are supposed to do it. But I also want those people. Um, who have harmed members of my community, I want them out of that department. And I don't want them out because they pled because they were going to plead guilty the, you know, the, the following day, so they resigned the day before. I want them out because I want the police department to push them out. That's how it's supposed to work. Yes, I'll continue to do my work. My work, by the way, is proof beyond a reasonable doubt through rules of evidence. It's hard. It's easy. Employment is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. There's an employment standard that we really need to get back to, um, and we need to drive our police department back to doing that kind of work. All right, thank you very much. Jackson County Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker, thank you for being on the forum. Thank you, everybody, thank you. for being here. Appreciate it. Yes, sure, have to. We hear a lot of about, uh, news about whether the police are under, the police commission is controlled by the state, and which it is, uh, and not Kansas City. Can you tell us what would be uh, the advantage of Kansas City being in control of it instead of the state? You know, I really don't think that that's something that should have to be defended. That, you know, defend, what the question is, is basically, Kansas City, defend your right to have a voice and a role in your police department. Hell no, I'm not doing that. Of course you should. Of course you should. Every police department in America functions this way. Not, not our way functions like, you know, in a way where 